My name is Marta Magellan, and I'm the author of Dragonflies, Water Angels, and Brilliant Bioindicators. Dragonflies, Water Angels, and Brilliant Bioindicators by Marta Magellan, illustrated by Mauro Magellan. In loving memory of Sammy Joe Chanel. Giants of the past. Long before dinosaurs roamed the earth, a huge insect zoomed over tropical forests. It looked like a giant version of dragonflies today, except it had teeth. It clacked its huge wings and gobbled up loads of bugs and even frogs. Sometimes called griffin fly, it lived a hundred million years before the dinosaurs took their first step. Scientists who study ancient animals believe it was the largest insect of all time. Its wingspan was about the same as that of a hawk or eagle. Imagine one of those landing on your head, but you won't see any today. They became extinct with the arrival of flying reptiles. Dragonflies now. Well, today, dragonflies are not a bit scary. We like to think of them as water angels. Why? Let's follow two around and see. Don't worry about getting too close. Unlike wasps and spiders, dragonflies won't attack or sting you. Best of all, they don't carry disease like mosquitoes. In spite of that fierce name, they're more like angels than dragons. But what do they have to do with water? What dragonflies reveal. Fresh water is not as easy to come by as we think. We see it come out of our faucets as if it were free, and we take it for granted. Fresh water is precious. It's a good sign to see a dragonfly. It means that nearby there are healthy rivers, lakes, ponds, or marshes. If you see a waterway with no dragonflies ever, it would be a bad sign. It would mean the water is polluted and their eggs probably would not hatch. By being there, dragonflies reveal the good quality of the water. Scientists call them bioindicators. What does that mean? What is a bioindicator? Nobody really names wild insects, but let's call the dragonfly Annie because its scientific name is Anoceptera. Annie's cousin is the damselfly, Zygoptera. We'll call her Zygi. Imagine, as we're following Annie around, we get lost and end up in a polluted waterway. Annie won't be there. Dragonflies don't hang out near water filled with toxins, chemicals that cause living things to get sick or die. That's what makes her such a good warning insect, a bioindicator. Any animal can warn us about the cleanliness of their surroundings, but Annie is particularly good at it. Wherever dragonflies linger, we know the water is healthy for living things. Ladies of the Water Finally, Annie finds a sparkling lake. She zigs and zags back and forth, up and down, across and around. She is searching for just the right spot to lay her eggs. Wherever she chooses to breed, it will always be either on, under, or at the water's edge. She might stop at a floating log or at some moss or mud along the shore. Or she might find clumps of plants floating in shallow water. The most important thing is the purity of the water around the nest. After much searching, she will land to deposit her eggs. The eggs hatch and live underwater until it is time to change into a dragonfly. The incredible transformation from egg to dragonfly is called metamorphosis. Immature dragonflies. If any found good, clean water, the eggs hatch in a few weeks or in some species, a few months. Then a little fish-like creature will shed its outer skin almost right away. Once the skin cracks, a six-legged nymph comes out. Under water, the nymph breathes through gills. And this is unusual. Its gills are inside its butt. That's no joke. The nymph breathes by inhaling water into its butt and squeezing it back out again. 
Adults would say it was being immature, but in this case, it's true. It's not an adult yet. But that's not all the nymph does. That's kind of funny. Speedy nymphs. By squeezing water out of its butt, the dragonfly nymph can propel itself in the opposite direction, rocketing forward like a jet ski. It is speedy enough to chase minnows and tadpoles for breakfast. It feeds on immature mosquitoes larvae too. Yay! The nymph will live one to four years underwater. Its skin will moat about 12 times. Finally, the skin dries out and the old nymph shell will split open so that an adult dragonfly can emerge. Lords and ladies of the air. Following Annie around isn't easy. Dragonflies are remarkable flyers. Some species travel thousands of miles, even over oceans, perfectly at home over large bodies of water. They take to the air vertically and hover like a helicopter for minutes at a time. Not only can they fly forward, but they can go backwards too, and they are capable of making surprising zigzag twists and turns through the reeds. What gives them this amazing ability? The dragonfly's front and back wings are not connected to each other and can beat separately. They can chase a lot of mosquitoes with those wings. They have perfect hunting eyes. If we pick up a magnifying glass and look at Annie's eyes, we'll see compound eyes with thousands of parts. Eyes like these help both Annie and Zygi have great eyesight. They can detect insects, their prey, to the left and right, above and below them. Zygi's eyes are wide apart while Annie's touch each other. Annie and Zagi are perfect hunting machines. If you watch Annie closely, you'll see that with only a tiny turn of her head, she can even see what's behind her. She will perch and wait until she sees a small insect flying overhead. Then she darts toward the prey and captures it from underneath. Handy hunting legs. When we think of legs, we usually think of walking. But neither Annie nor Zagi can walk like other animals. Instead, their legs are made to catch flying insects while dashing through the air. Their legs point forward so they can grab their prey on the fly. Both Annie and Zagi make a kind of basket with their legs and scoop their prey with them. If the prey is too big, they will perch somewhere to eat it. But Annie can easily eat her basket of mosquitoes in mid-flight. And that's what we call fast food how they got their name. Why call them dragonflies when they look nothing like dragons? Strangely enough, both Native American and European folk stories claim they were once dragons. Actually, people have called them all kinds of names. Old Floridians called them mosquito hawks because they ate so many of those pesky critters. Dragonflies were often called water witches, devil's horse, or devil's needle. Luckily, the name Dragonfly stuck. It's an awesome name for an awesome insect. Angels or Devils In Europe, there is a myth that dragonflies will poke out people's eyes or sew up their mouths. Old Swedish folktales claim that when a dragonfly hovers around you, it is weighing your soul for the devil. Unlike those creepy myths, the medicine men and women of the Pueblo tribes in the southwestern United States thought better of dragonflies. They believed the dragonfly spirit healed people. And when dragonflies appeared near water, the Navajos believed the water was pure enough to drink. How true. Although some people nicknamed them water witches, we know they're more like water angels. We need them to survive and be bioindicators. They will keep us informed about the quality of our Earth's scarce and precious fresh water. The end, except for the back matter. Precious water. We think of it as if it's unlimited. We waste it and we even pay too much to drink it from little plastic bottles. The Earth has more ocean than land, but most of it, around 97%, is salt water. Only about one half to one percent of all fresh water is accessible in rivers, lakes, and streams. So water needs to be conserved. What can you do at home? 
Well, turn off the faucet while you're brushing your teeth or washing your face. Or tightly turn the faucet off so that there are no drips. Drips can waste a lot of water over time. Shower instead of bathe. When you are old enough, switch from baths to quick showers. They use less water than filling up a tub. In places where it rains enough, tell your parents about collecting rainwater in barrels to water plants and grass. Avoid bottled water. Companies take water from sp springs or even from faucets like yours and pour them into plastic bottles. That water costs a lot of money and the plastic is a disaster for the oceans. Choose native plants. By planting trees and plants for your yard that do not need excessive watering, you will be supporting native wildlife and conserving water too. A double win. Thank you for listening to Dragonflies, Water Angels, and Brilliant Bioindicators. Hello, my name is Marta Magellan, and I'm the author of Anoli Invasion. Anoli Invasion by Marta Magellan, illustrations by Mauro Magellan. A green anoli watches a cricket crawl on a branch. The cricket doesn't know it's in danger. Wild lizards don't have names, but let's call this green anoli Carolina because it is sometimes known by its common name, Carolina anoli. She stays so still that the cricket doesn't know she's there. Without a sound, she attacks. The cricket is a goner. Green anolis like Carolina love crickets and beetles and moths. Yuck, they even love cockroaches. But that's good because they help the plants by eating some of the bad bugs in the gardens and forests. They even act as unintentional pollinators by sipping nectar from flower to flower. Pollination is what allows plants to make seeds. Green anoles are good for plants, but it's about to become harder for Carolina and her friends to visit their usual flowers. Carolina watches a small brown lizard scurry through the bush in her territory. The male brown anole bobs his head up and down, does a few push-ups, and flashes his orange dewlap. It is a warning. Carolina turns from green to gray to tan, and finally to dark brown. The invading lizard has put her in a very bad mood. Green anoles change colors when they feel threatened or sick or too hot. Because of that, some people call green anoles chameleons, but they are not true chameleons. True chameleons can turn many different colors. So who was this brown lizard that didn't turn colors at all? The stranger is a Cuban brown anole. It is taking Carolina's territory. Over time, Carolina sees more strange lizards like him. Those brown anoles weren't in the United States at first. It is called an invasion. How did that happen? About a hundred years ago in Cuba, a brown anole hitched a ride on a boat. Let's call her Cubanita. When Cubanita tried to leave, the ocean stretched out all around. Soon the boat docked. Cubanita quickly sped off the boat and looked around her new home. Where was she? The place was warm, humid, and full of palm trees and shrubs. She had landed in Florida. She found some moist leaf litter and laid an egg. Every week or two during that summer, she laid one or two eggs. Over time, little brown anoles were everywhere. Then a bigger, meaner anole invaded Florida. In the 1950s, the big-headed night anole hitched a ride to Florida too. It also came from Cuba. 
it became more of a threat because it eats the smaller anoles. And that's not all. It eats frogs and baby birds too. And that wasn't the last of the invasions. Around 1975, a new enemy invaded, this time from Puerto Rico. The crested anole fought harder and ran faster than both the green and brown anoles. After the crested anoles invaded, brown anoles moved to middle levels of the plants and trees. Two other invaders, the giant anole from Jamaica and the bark anole from Haiti, have also made their way into Florida. There isn't enough food in the lower plants for all of them to share. Carolina and her relatives had to find another way to stay alive. Invaders are not good for native green anoles like Carolina. The different species of lizards compete for the same food. Worse, the non-native anoles eat the eggs of the green anole. The invaders eat more of the food so the green anoles have to climb higher up in the plants and even higher in the trees. This is called displacement, and that's trouble. Cuban brown anoles have now spread out to other parts of the southern United States. Crested anoles and nigenoles have wandered north to central Florida. They are roaming even farther up, displacing more green anoles. When invasive species have been living in a place long enough, scientists say they are established. To stay alive, green anoles have to make changes. The good news is green anoles are not extinct. Far from it. So far, they aren't endangered either. They are alive and well in most of the southeastern United States. When they climb higher up in the trees because the invasive species are in their territory, it's called adapting. Humans need to be careful not to let invasive species of any kind overrun native territories like those of the green anole. We need green anoles in our gardens and forests to help plants grow. As long as they keep adapting, they will stay off the endangered list and help our flowers and plants thrive. The end. Okay, I am um, going to show you the book. It's right here. It's called Aliana Reaches for the Moon, and it's written by me, Laura Rediger, and it's illustrated by Ariel Boroff. Beautiful pictures that you'll be seeing in a moment. I'm just Aliana Reaches for the Moon, a steambook for aspiring scientists. Written by Laura Rediger, illustrated by Ariel Boroff, published by Eifrig Publishing. Aliana lives in the Rocky Mountains, where the night sky holds more stars than you can dream of, and the moon shimmers like gold. The full moon lights up Aliana's whole world. Each and every morning, Papa says, it's a beautiful mountain day. What do you have planned? Each and every morning, Aliana replies, we're exploring in the woods. Or, I'm reading an interesting book. Today, she is reading about the moon. Sometimes, using her favorite word, Aliana says, I'm creating something special. You'll see when I'm done. Aliana has a big imagination and loves making things for her family, especially her little brother, Gustavo. Some days, Aliana creates things in her room. Some days, Aliana creates things outside. Sometimes, Aliana creates things at night. Today, 
Aliana is baking with Gustavo. Are we making these cuppy cakes for my birthday? No, Gus, your birthday is still two weeks away. Besides, I'm working on a secret present for you. Be patient. Aliana's creativity is messy. She often leaves a trail of treasures around the house. Her room is the messiest of all. Mama and Papa are very patient for grown-ups, but even the most patient grown-ups say, clean your room. Creativity can be a little messy. I'm experimenting to make Gus's birthday surprise just right. You'll see. Aliana's parents know their daughter is a clever girl with an amazing imagination. If she's creating something for Gustavo, they'll just have to wait. Instead of finishing her project, Aliana spends her days outside with Gus, exploring animal tracks and wildflowers in the woods. She notices things and shows them to Gus. She teaches him how to notice things too. Mama, look what I made. You always manage to see the beauty in everything, Mama replies. After a week of hikes in the woods, a day horseback riding, and two visits to the library, Aliana spends a day playing in her room. At first, her parents think she is cleaning. Sometimes parents can be silly. She's reading to discover how to create the perfect birthday surprise. Aliana organizes pieces of quartz, crystals, and coins from her piggy bank into rows. Using marbles and several small mirrors, she plays with new shapes. She selects two stem vases, two bottles from the recycling bin, and one very tall, skinny drinking glass. Aliana pours water into each one and carries them on a cookie sheet to her room. Carefully, she drops coins, marbles, and pieces of quartz into the five containers. She tops each one with a crystal from her collection and steps back to look at her masterpiece. Perfecto. During dinner, Papa asks, did you do anything fun today? My secret project for Gus is ready. You'll see it tonight, Aliana whispers. After dinner, Gus and Aliana climb into their treehouse to read books. Gus is excited because tomorrow is his birthday. Aliana is excited too. For weeks, she has been planning and preparing for tonight. The sun begins to set and the light in the treehouse grows dim. Aliana waits for the moon to appear in the night sky. She is almost ready to show off her creation. Gus, she whispers, come with me. Aliana sees the moon reach the perfect spot, and then, just like that, it happens. Her experiment works. Aliana is beaming. Her face is almost as bright as the full moon. The light from the moon shines through the skylight onto the creation in Aliana's room. In the window... Aliana's masterpiece sparkles and shimmers. It doesn't take much imagination to see five candles 
glowing. You made me a magical birthday cake, Gus shouts. We have our very own astronomer. I'm so proud of you, Papa says. And that's the end of the story. And on the last page, there's an author's note, note explaining the phases of the moon. And I won't read it to you, but it explains why even though the moon always stays the same shape, which is a sphere, that it looks like it's different shapes during the 29 days that it revolves around the earth. And it's because the sun is reflecting light and different amounts of light reflect based on where the moon is in its revolution. And now I'd like to share with you some photos. And these were some of my inspiration from, there they are. This was some of my inspiration when I wrote the book, Aliana Reaches for the Moon. When I moved to the Rocky Mountains in 2016, which is when I started writing the story, I discovered that the moon is much brighter without all of the light pollution here away from the city. So I'm going to show you a few of the pictures that I've taken over the time that I was here. Some of these are of the lunar eclipse that happened a couple of years ago. And I took pictures of this. These are the lunar eclipse. I took pictures every eight minutes to show how it was changing. And as the eclipse happened, less and less of the moon was visible. And then it turned and it came back and became visible. And it had a reddish purple glow, which is what these pictures are. These are unfiltered pictures of the moon. And so I played around with the idea of using the light of the moon. And I wanted, because I'm a teacher, I wanted to include uh, as many learning opportunities within the framework of a story that she had to be patient, that her parents also had to be patient with her. Um, when I reached out to some astronomers for the um, endorsements that we got for the book, that she said, I love that you're encouraging creativity and explaining to parents that science is messy because parents are so worried about the mess that their children are making that they're not providing the opportunity sometimes to be creative. So a little backstory on this book. This book is based off of an experience me and Graciana had. This is Graciana. She will be five next month. <laughs> and so this book is all about a little girl who is discussing the question, what are you? It was inspired by a moment when we were in Target and we were checking out. And the cashier looked at her and said, you're beautiful. What are you? And she was like two years old at the time. And I was like, oh, she's going to have to live with this question just like I did. And so I was like, somebody needs to write a book about this. And so I was that somebody and I wrote that book. Uh, all right. So this book is called Beautiful, Wonderful, Strong Little Me. And who, wrote, I read it? who wrote the book? You. Yeah. I open my eyes and what do I see? Beautiful, you know? Wonderful, Strong Little Me. With divinely dark skin that tans in the sun and freckles all over that dazzle and stun. Uh, my hair is so frizzy. Look at my hair, frizzy, wild, never tame. My gorgeous thick eyebrows that accent my frame. I'm a smart, unique girl, happy and proud. I run out exclaiming and singing out loud. Smiling a smile that's Lily. as wide as the sky. I see all my friends who are playing nearby. Lily, they cry out, calling my name. I take off like lightning to join in a game. Swinging and roaring. Can I say all of them? Uh -huh. Hopscotch and... Exploring. Exploring and mud pies. 
hopscotch and blue pies. Baseball and mud pies, clouds in the blue skies. Then off to a puddle where we untie our laces, splash in the water, and make silly faces. In the reflection, I clearly can see that all of my friends do not look quite like me. What are you? Some ask, very blunt and forthcoming. You look so unique that it has our mind drumming. Is your family Hispanic or maybe Egyptian, Indian, Brazilian, or a little Sicilian? Are you white with some black? Do you come from Iraq? Are you Danish or Asian or mixed with some Cajun? Do you speak Portuguese or Spanish at all? Do you come from Peru, Ecuador, or Nepal? People don't know how these questions might feel, so I take a deep breath before my repeal. My skin and my hair sometimes make me stand out, but the way that I look is not all I'm about. I'm sassy and smart with a kind, giving heart. I'm courageous and brilliant and fierce and resilient. I am not a puzzle to figure out or a mysterious artifact to learn all about. I stand here before you, and what should you see? What should you see? This. A beautiful, your... wonderful, strong. This is beautiful, wonderful, strong to me. I'm not your plain princess. From all of the books. It's great I am different. I'm proud of my looks. I'm not your plain princess from all of the books. Say I said that. You don't want to say it over and over. <laughs> I swish my hips and twirl my curl and show them a smile of a confident girl. I'm a beautiful, wonderful, strong little me. And I don't need explaining to any degree. Yeah. The end. And thanks for watching. Bye. See you soon. <laughs> thanks, guys. Like I said, beautiful, wonderful, strong little me is now available. You can order it directly from my publisher at ifrickpublishing.com.